a psychologically tested belief of our time is that the central nervous system, which feeds its impulses directly to the brain, the conscious and subconscious, is unable to discern between the real and the vividly ma imagined experience, if there is a difference, and most of us believe there is. Am I being clear? For to examine these concepts requires tremendous energy and discipline. To allow the unknown to occur and to occur requires clarity. And where there is clarity, there is no choice. And where there is choice, there is misery. But then, why should anybody listen to me? Why should I speak since I know nothing? I'll tell you why I speak. Because this is one of those films that you've been missing because assholes keep pushing it down. Here's your damn ranch show. Hey, hey, this is the Rancho. I've said it all before. The money's in. I'm made of tin. I'm here to bring you more. I'm your host, E. Adam Thomas. And tonight, we bring you possibly one of the most bizarre, amusing, and poignant movies ever to be shat into the discount bin just because of who's in it. Tonight, I'm giving you head. The 1968 Bob Raphaelson film starring the Monkees, Peter Tork, Davy Jones, Mickey Dolenz, and Mike Neesmith. Co-written by Raphaelson and Jack Nicholson, the movie is equal parts lunatic silliness, social commentary, psychedelic mindfuck, and proof that this manufactured ban for a cheesy sitcom was far more in reality than the sum of its parts. On the surface, it almost seems to be simultaneously lampooning every a aspect of late 60s pop culture and bashing you over the head with an al almost Monty Python-esque flow from sketch to sketch, which is literally only missing the Terry Gilliam animated linking segments. The film in its own way is not too dissimilar from the more high-profile films made by the Beatles, such as Help and Yellow Submarine. But strangely, despite the comparisons between the monkeys and the Beatles, Characterizing the Prefab Four as nothing more than vapid, pale caricatures of the more musically respected Liverpudlian Leviathans, this movie shows the true potential, both as musicians and as conceptualists, that Neesmith, Dolans, Tork, and Jones had reluctantly concealed under the guise of basic sitcom goofballs. Now, I mentioned that this film was written by Bob Raphaelson and Jack Nicholson. And that fact by itself makes this film fucking cool as hell. But what's generally not known is that the guys in the band were actually given a little bit of creative license in this film. Possibly more so than was ever given John, Paul, George, and Ringo in their films. The fucked up thing is, this film was doomed. Fucking doomed! First of all, the public perception of the monkeys at the time was not too dissimilar from our own current disdain for Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber. They were seen as cheap knockoffs of the Beatles and frequently blasted in the popular press of the time as talentless hacks. Now I'm not saying that these guys were in reality the most amazing actor, musician, comedic conceptualists of their generation, but they certainly deserved a fuckload more credit than they got. The beautiful thing is, they were all well aware of this public perception and that, too, is pointedly lampooned in the film. To the careful observer, this film features some pretty gutsy commentary as well. There's actually some pretty disturbing Vietnam War footage here, and it's used to great effect. It's not just a couple of silly, couple of hours of silly madcap farce. Now that's not to say this film isn't without its flaws. Some of the bits that are meant to be outlandish and fun aren't really the bit with Davy Jones as a boxer is just an unbalanced mess without a punchline, and there's nothing really all that funny about it. It could have been meant as a link, 
like some of the short bits Monty Python did on their series, but it just dragged on. Musically, this film features some of the best music the group ever did, and for my money, it's almost as good as some of the better mid-60s output by the Beatles. One of the most galling things about this film, and the monkeys as a whole, is that at least three of the four members of the band were actual musicians and songwriters, but the vast majority of their output, especially during the sitcom, was written and played by other artists. It wasn't until after the series was canceled that they were actually able to bust out on their own and do their own thing a little bit more. As it ended up, Mike Neesmith was the only one in the band to achieve any kind of solo success as a musician. And even then, due to his involvement with the Monkees, he was largely dismissed by the public and critics. I'm not saying that they were as good as the Beatles, or that they deserved the same level of adulation, but the fuck sticks who planned their career for them certainly didn't do them any favors. The biggest blow to this movie had nothing at all to do with how well made or inventive it was. It was simply a matter of timing. Due to production delays, the film actually ended up not getting released until after their weekly series was unceremoniously cancelled by NBC, a mere two months beforehand, which totally ass-fucked them at the box office. Had this film just come out maybe a few months earlier, it probably would have saved the show and given it a new look and feel as well. Keep in mind, this was also the peak of the popularity of so-called subversive shows like Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, a show that deftly danced along the lines of television taboo and was supposedly one of the most hated series in television history among network censors. Head showed that the monkeys could have easily competed on virtually every level with Laugh-In. I've heard people in the past refer to this film as a guilty pleasure. Well, get the fuck over yourselves, you pretentious sacks of Victor Mature's ball sweat. This movie is fun. It's interesting, it's a fucking freak ride, and it's a hell of a lot more entertaining than some other rock band movie mashups I could mention. Tommy? 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 Okay. Rantometer time, now with more hair gravy. Artistic gets a four, losing a point only because the film occasionally went into some directions that were obviously not quite as well thought out as they could have been. Coolness gets a five. Seriously, I don't care if you don't dig your parents, or hell, by now, your grandparents' music. It's still got some awesome tunes, and it's both funny and fucking trippy as hell. Originality gets a four because it comes pretty close to capturing the late 60s as a whole from the ridiculous to the sublime. Suckitude only gets half of a blade, largely because after the film's initial release, about 20 minutes got cut out and I never got to see it in its full form. That gives Head a respectable 12 and a half and I urge you all to give it a chance. And if you ever happen upon the original director's cut, let me know. I'd really like to see it. Next week, in honor of the release of the final Pink Floyd album, The Endless River, due to be released on November 7th, we'll be taking a look at the most controversial artistic endeavor in their history, the 1982 film version of the album The Wall, starring Bob Geldof. December is all request month here on Film Rants, so get those requests in for what films you want to subject to my rage. You can message me here through Facebook, Google+, or Twitter using the hashtag FilmRantsEAT. Email me at FilmRantsEAT at Cox.net. Look for me on Ello, if it's still around by the time this episode airs, or just comment right here. See you next week, and remember... Nobody ever lends money to a man with a sense of humor.
Angry Men Reviews. Many fucks said, no fucks given. Welcome to another internet talking head show. Literally. Hey, I'm a talking head. Burn into on the house. Monkeys is the craziest people.